review some of the stuff that's needed for getting the technician's license. So for the next 10 weeks, every Monday night at 6 o'clock, we will be meeting here at the clubhouse. Thank you. And going over information for the technician's class. So I just handed out a syllabus. Figure we ought to make it official, you know, make it look real, because it is real. And so, as you'll notice on the syllabus for each of the 10 weeks, these are the things that we're going to be covering. Uh, tonight is kind of an introduction to amateur radio and what it's all about. And then we'll start getting into some of the more detailed information. Uh, Signals, radio waves, electricity, components, uh, all kinds of fun stuff that you never thought you'd ever want to know about. But uh, it's all good. But before we begin, why don't we have some introductions so that everybody knows who everybody is. Uh, I'm Jeff. Uh, my call sign is N0JFY. And uh, I'm a uh, board member here. And... Uh, Chairman of the Training Committee. So, Randy? I'm Randy, WJ0L. I'm the president of the club here, and I think I nudged you into that training position. I think you kind of put my arm yeah. behind my back and pulled it up pretty hard. Best thing, best thing I ever did. <laughs> All right, Patrick. Yeah, I'm Patrick K of Zero DVD, and uh, I'm a club member that's here to review. Uh, All right. Well, welcome, Patrick. It's good to have you. Back here in the back, we've got... I'm Lee, K9MP. All right. Director of Emergency Communications. All right. And Kay? I'm Kay, KB0 CEF, and I'm currently the treasurer for, for the club. All right. And up here, I know this lady, but everybody else might not. Oh, okay. You left me for last, I know. <laughs> I just went around a circle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it made it so I would be last. Right? Yeah. Okay, I'm Penny. I'm his wife. She, she's the better half, and you're not last because we got... Well, someone else came in. <laughs> Jim over here. Good evening. Nice to meet you, Penny. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So Jim is the vice president of our, of our club. All right, so when we talk about amateur radio, what in the world is amateur radio? Uh, turn it on, then it works better. Okay, so amateur radio, often known by the term ham radio. And it doesn't mean that you're going out and buying a ham and having it for Easter dinner. Uh, although we would like to do that sometimes, right? But uh, any idea where that word ham came from? A little bit of history? Anybody have any idea? I have heard a couple of different possibilities, but one was the uh, initials of the three people that started it. I don't remember their name, last names off the top of my head, but H-A-M with three names. There were three names, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Um, I've also heard that, you know, it's not known, um, but back in the day, early days of, of amateur radio, when people were using the Morse code and they were not very good, they were called hammer, hammer, hams? Ham-fisted. Ham-fisted, and it came from that. But over the years, ham radio operators has become an endeared term to the, to the hobby. And uh, so it's, uh, it's something that uh, the people go by, and it's, it's a good thing. So what can you do with, with, with ham radio, amateur radio? What, what's out there for us? Any ideas? POTA. POTA. What in the world is POTA? Well, I was told it's parks on the air. Okay, parks on the air. You can take your radio out to a park, set it up, and make as many contacts as you can. 
make 10 contacts, you're activating that park. You can also sit at home and do POTA and make contacts with somebody that's out sitting at a park. You got to have both or you don't make that contact. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about contacts in a, in a little bit. Um, but anyway, for this class, we are going to be using the ARRL Ham Radio License Manual, the Technician's Manual. There's going to be a new one coming out uh, within the next month or two because they, the uh, FCC is changing the questions up. And uh, as I got thinking about that, I'm going, man, we're going to teach this class. And, uh, they're changing the questions. What, what are we going to be talking about differently? So I went and I printed out the new set of questions. And just to give you an idea, they have, in March, they made four question modifications. They changed some words. And in January, they deleted one question. And they made five other modifications. They changed the V to an E on five questions. Very, very limited uh, changes to the actual exam. And there's a pool, pool of about 400 questions that they choose from to, to make up the test. So they'll go out and grab so many questions from each section and put them on a piece of paper, and that's your test. So we'll, uh, we'll get more into what the testing means and what it's all about uh, as, we go down the, as we go down the road. Okay. So as you think of amateur radio and you think of the things that amateur radio can do, you can do POTA. What else? What else is there? Communicate with your friends. Communicate with your friends. Emergency communications, yeah. DX. DX. Okay, what, what, do, what does DX mean? Distance communication, out, let's say, outside the United States. Okay. And without our infrastructure, too. Okay, without, without a, an infrastructure, you can, you can do it with, with battery-powered stuff, right? Right. And uh, so what, what happens when, uh, you know... We, we all kind of rely on these things, don't we? They become second nature to us. I remember growing up, I would have never dreamed that I could fit this in my pocket and what it would do. Dick Tracy stuff. Dick Tracy stuff, exactly. Right there, huh? <laughs> so you, you could do Dick Tracy stuff, uh, you know, Star Trek, you know, their communicators. And that seemed just so far off when I was a kid. Well, now I carry a computer in my pocket. So you just, uh, you know, things change and, they, uh, and things go on. So, you know, as you think about it, we've talked about several things you can do uh, with, with amateur radio. One of the things that it's known as, it's, it's a national asset. You know, if the systems go down, and you need to communicate with somebody, you can grab one of these, and I can talk to Jim. And Jim can be 20 miles away, and I, I can talk to Jim if I need to. So in an emergency, it works well. I remember when we lived in Michigan a number of years ago, the whole East Coast, the power grid went down. And it happened to be, we lived on a street. The other side of the street was without power. We had power. We were very lucky. And it was down for, what, a few, few days. And everybody from outside of the, the neighbor, outside of our area, came in because we were the only place that had gas stations that had power. And within several hours, there was no gas. So it's, things can get crazy real quick. And if you can't communicate, if you have a radio, you can communicate. You can communicate... Let's say we have a, a natural disaster here, which, which can happen. And we need to get information to family that might be in, a, in another state. No phones, can't call them. But if you get on the radio, you can get a message to them. So it becomes a very useful thing in, in cases of an emergency. So you'll also hear that amateur radio is an art. Now remember that word, art. Because that is on one of the test questions. 
when it talks about what amateur radio is. If you remember the term art, you'll be able to answer that question. That's just a something to remember. All right. You're also going to hear the term as you go into amateur radio, a term called Elmer. Now, I had an Uncle Elmer years ago. Um, but what's an Elmer? Teacher. A teacher. Yeah. A mentor. A mentor. Exactly. A trainer. A friend. A friend. Absolutely. So the word and the term Elmer, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, started with uh, a ham operator named Lit Rick Lundquist, Lindquist, and he traced it back to 1971, the term Elmer, because he had a friend named Elmer that was helping him through a ham radio and helped him get going. And he figured everybody needed to have an Elmer in their life, and the term stuck. And so, you know, you'll, you'll find within the ham radio community that you will have friends that will help you, and they're Elmers. I remember I had, had Jim come over to the house last fall. We put up an antenna. I'm thankful for his, his guidance and, and helping me get that antenna up, and I've, I've talked all over the place with, with that antenna, just a wire up through the tree. And uh, so it's, uh, it's very good, and it's a very tight community that you, you can talk to people and get information. Um, and it's very, you know, you can get help. Every night, 7 o'clock, we run a welfare net. Lee runs a welfare net, and that helps everybody to, to stay connected. And if there's somebody that needs help, help can be there almost instantaneously. All right. Any idea when the first ham, first amateur license was granted? Any idea? Early 1900s, it was. It was in 19. Close, close. To send out an emergency distress signal, yeah. Okay, so so the very first amateur license were issued in 1912. And after that, the number of hams grew quite rapidly. The early stations used Spark. Any idea what Spark is? I didn't have any idea what Spark was. Any idea? Well, Spark is literally a vigorous and noisy electrical arc that's used to generate radio waves. Wasn't very safe, wasn't very efficient, and it was very soon replaced by more effective vacuum tube transmitters. But initially it was spark. And uh, that's, that's how the first radio signals were generated. Following that, um, in the 1920s, there was voice on the radio. And you started hearing not only voice, but you still had Morse code. Morse code goes way back to the telegraph lines, and it was on the radio, uh, Morse code, and still is. Randy is uh, definitely a very proficient user of what we call CW or Morse code. In 1934, the amateur service started, and that's when all the amateur radios it became a service. And you'll hear about radio services, and... Uh, it's basically governmental organizations that, that monitor and control the, the radio waves. If you think about it, there's a lot of radio waves out there, a lot of, a lot of spectrum. And I'm not going to buy that uh, auto warranty. But there's, there's a lot of radio waves out there and a lot of spectrum. And if you just go out there haphazardly, it's going to get totally out of control. So they separated the radio waves into different segments. And we'll talk about those uh, probably next week. 
But uh, each of these comes under a different kind of service. And those started back in 1934 with the amateur service. In 1961, amateur operators built and put up the first satellite. It was known as Oscar One. And then in the 1970s, we started to have repeaters. And we'll get more into what a repeater does, but it can allow a radio signal coming from a radio like this to talk to a repeater, which then that signal gets repeated out from that repeater and other people can hear it. And it expands your distance that this, this radio can, can talk. Normally, you can get maybe three to five miles radio to to radio, but if you're talking to a repeater, you can get out 20, 50 miles fairly easily with just, just a handheld. All right. So I have a question. Yes. So you said it could go, you said four to five miles with, uh, without a repeater? Yeah. Is that like line of sight? Okay. Yes. Yep, pretty much line of sight. So if, if you've got a big building in the way, you might have some, some issues and it, it might not get through. Or even a little building like this one. Or even a little building like this one. This, this building itself has a lot of metal, and so it can create some problems in, in transmitting. So, and you'll notice in this building, or if you go outside and look, we have a lot of antennas which we're hooked to, to, to get out of the building. Just for clarification, even though from the repeater to the repeater, you know, repeater relay signal to, I guess, omit the, whatever interference it gets in, the signal gets into in between, and then, like we put a repeater on it, you know, there would be less interference? Yeah, there, there can be. I'm not sure how all the repeater to repeater stuff works. But there's a lot of stuff that can be done that way, and a lot of, a lot of amateur radio operators do that. So, yeah, a good, good point, and it's a very good question. Um, any other questions before we, we continue? And this gentleman that just came in, he's Rick, KU5MC. Welcome, Rick. All right. So as we come through, you know, basically the timeline, 1912 first uh, licenses, 1920, we have voice on the air, 1934, we've got the amateur cert. At the amateur radio service. We come up to 1961. We got a satellite up in this up in the sky. I'm not too good at spelling. I'm not too good at writing, and uh, my wife can attest to that. Don't. Which is why we talk on the radio. Which is why we talk on the radio. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that was Oscar One. That was built by amateur radios. Is that right? Yeah. Transmitted a simple Morse code back to Earth for several weeks. So it only lasted for a few weeks. Yeah. I don't know how, how high it got, but it got up at least into the well into the ionosphere and it may have just been up there for a few weeks before it came back down so yeah so that's a little bit of the history of, of ham radio but what are we what is ham radio today what is what does it look like today and uh, I probably should be going through some of these slides too so with more than 740,000 practitioners in the U.S. and 1.75 million worldwide, there are federally licensed amateur radio operators everywhere. In your neighborhood, 
in your workplace, and in your schools. That's a lot of people that have those licenses. And uh, if you look at the directory out there on the FCC, you see lots of ham operators. So I, I was first introduced to ham radio when we lived in Michigan. I had, a, I had a buddy that was heavy into ham ham radio, and he kept telling me, you need to go get a license. And I kept telling him, no, I don't. And he kept saying, you need to go get a license. I said, no, I don't. I never did. And then a couple of years ago, I decided, yeah, maybe I should. And I did. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay. So, people just like you use ham radio to communicate without relying on the internet or a cell phone and could go everywhere and anywhere. You can hike a trail, you can climb a mountain, you can paddle a river, and you can take your radio with you. Soda. Soda. Yes, soda. S O T A. Any idea what that might stand for? I, I, Can I say that word? Can you say Summit's on the air. There you go. And as long as we're talking, we might as well put Iota up there as well. Islands on the air. There is another one still. Uh, Yoda, use on the air. Real quick history, the guy that came up with it was a licensed ham operator at the age of four. Yeah. Four, four years old. Joda. Joda. We like acronyms in the ham radio business. <laughs> this is, what is it, Lee? Jamboree. Jamboree on the air. And of course, we have. Is that, you know, quick, is that nationwide here, or is that worldwide champion on the air for the staff? Worldwide. 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 Yeah. Are all these worldwide? Yes. yes. Yes, they are. And they're just different activities over the air. Yep. So, so if you get on to parks on the air, you can see where people are at right now transmitting from a park. It's, it, with them, on their website, it'll tell you exactly where they're at and what frequency on the radio they're operating. And you'll see that they're, especially in the morning, I, I've noticed a lot over in Great Britain yeah. and, and in the European Union, Union early in the morning. Yeah. Scotland, you can usually hear in the morning as well. Yep. France was on early, this early this, this morning. Uh, I heard a photo coming in from Windsor Castle. Really? Sure. That would be the Jubilee. The Jubilee. Yep. Yep. And he, I can make him out. Man, he was getting hammered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Everybody was trying to contact him back. Yep, okay. Penny. Parks on the air. Is it, are these national parks? They're national parks and state parks. And state parks. Yep. So, so when we drive out to Idaho in July... I'm planning on stopping at Teddy Roosevelt National Park and pulling out my radio and doing a pota. Just kind of letting the boss know that we're going to take a take lunch there. Detour. And you'll have your license by then, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to soften it up, bro. <laughs> Give me that mic. Oh, <laughs> uh, yep, yep. So, but it's uh. It can be a lot of fun, and you can really do a lot of things enjoyable with the radio. But by the same token, it can be a very serious business when things happen. You know, there was just a week or so ago, it was on Memorial Day, wasn't it, when we had an activation for Skywarn um, because the weather was bad, and people, members of the radio club went out to look for, for storms. And uh, I missed that one. I, I saw the text message come in and I, I looked at the sky and I go, there's not a cloud in it. Well, I was sitting in Denver, so. But the notification went out to me to, to go out and, and look. 
And, uh, we'll send you reservations next time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but there's, there's a lot of public service that can happen. If, if there is a civil unrest or a natural disaster, a lot of times they will need radio operators to help with communication. And so it's important. And it's, it's not only fun, but it's a, it's a great public service. So in ham radio today, there are a lot of different things that can be done that couldn't be done, couldn't have been done here or here or here or here or even here. Any idea what some of those things might be? Digital. Digital. Yeah, I'm going to have to erase some of this stuff here. And, and Lee, I know I'm getting out of your spot. Do you want me over here? Digital. What else? Internet. Internet. What's that? Let's expand on that. Internet. I, I got a radio. And I, and I know how to make this thing get to the Internet. How do I get this thing get to the Internet? Or can I? What is it? Balfin? Yeah, it's Balfin. Okay, so you just need a couple other pieces of equipment and you can get that onto the internet. Unless you have a DMR radio. Unless I have a DMR radio, which I have right here. And this can go through the internet, through the internet anywhere, in the world. anywhere in the world. With just this radio right here. Five watt radio. Yeah, so pretty cool, right? So what happens if you're in an emergency and somehow you need to get a message out to Grandma Johnson out in Utah? How do you get a message out to her? You can't call her. She doesn't have a radio. Email. You can send email over the radio. What a great thing. Technology. Technology. That's where we're at. Where's it going to go as technology continues to expand and improve? Sky's the limit. Sky's the limit. Satellite. Satellite. Yeah, we were up at, uh, at uh, Camp Ripley a few weeks ago, and uh, one of our ham operators was up there, and he had a handheld radio like this. He had it hooked to a handheld antenna, and the space station was coming. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of different people that have, have gotten their ham radio license. So it's, it's, not just, uh, it's not just an old folks social club. Well, in addition, what we had two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had a 12 and a four, another 12 and 14 year old passenger technician. Yeah. So it's... You know, it's very, a very active uh, art, an art form. Okay. So some of the things that, uh, I haven't been doing very good at this, have I? Outer space, we talked about public service. Okay, if there's a disaster. You know, we hope there's no disasters in our neighborhood. But it can happen. We need to be ready, right, so that we can provide our services as needed. Uh, Rick's got a van just about like that. It's a little different color. Yeah, it's not anything like that. That was ugly. We need to have this picture to a Rick picture. Yeah, but look at the tower he's got on his van. <laughs> he saw me. So, so you, you drive mobile, you put up a, you know, an antenna, and you can, you can be active real quick. Quick question about the subject. Yeah. Um, you know, when the last time, um, uh, I guess, the broad area actually summoned um, ham radio operators for, I guess, assistance? You know, if, go ahead, Rick. Remember when we spoke with the Red Cross when they said that, that uh, 
They called the ham operators out of Duluth to help them with that apartment complex. How long ago that was? That was a couple of years. That was within the reason. Well, yeah, up in yeah. the Iron Range, they had a 52, 54 family apartment complex, one up in flames. And they had no cell coverage, nothing. And the best they could do, they summoned some ham operators out of the Duluth area to come over and help with communications, you know, Red Cross support and food and shelter and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and if I'm not mistaken, even when we had the, the riots down in the cities, um, there were some ham operators that were helping to support uh, down there at that time. I got to hear some of on one of the repeaters down there. They were uh, definitely keeping in touch with folks, making sure they were okay because they were in the middle of that. Yeah. And so, you know, definitely, you know, very usable and it's, and it's immediate in the current around us. We just never know when it's going to happen. We hope it doesn't, but we need to be ready. Uh, community events, um, races and, and different things. Often they will need ham radio operators. So I know the club has done some things. At, at Tour of Saints is our big one. Okay. So there's, there's some opportunities, you know, when there might be a bicycle race or a foot race or whatever where they need uh, communication. And uh, ham radio operators are there to do that. Parades is another one. What do we reckon that the little priest to support Grandma's Marathon? We'd have a whole, the whole route was lined with ham radio operators. Mm -hmm. So it's def definitely, you know, supporting our community. Okay. So as we think about it, there are a lot of things that we can do as, as, a, as a ham operator, we can uh, talk. It's one of the favorite pastimes. What else? Biting. Any idea what that would be? Anyway, Jim. Digital. Bite. Di digital. Bites, yeah. <laughs> All right, building. What, do, what would an amateur operator do when it comes to building? Building friendships. Funny you might ask that. Funny you might ask that. <laughs> well, Jim, Jim is building an antenna. All right. Uh, doorway into a lot of other fields around, like building two, and like for us as a drone operating. Yeah. Like, you actually need a ham radio operator to build drones on a five gig. So. Yep. Very good. It, it, it and it can lead you into other other hobbies and stuff. I think I think Patrick, you got into three uh, D printing or something. electronics and circuits and things like that that you can take into other fields you know and yeah exactly exactly very good great example software okay software you want to expand upon that a little bit Jim what, what as, we can as we get into the digital side of things more and more Creative people out there that write software are solving issues with communicating between uh, different pieces of equipment and streamlining the process to make everything work seamlessly in this uh, digital age that we're finding ourselves in. Yeah, yeah, great, great example. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, what computer language do they use to write the software? Everything. Out there. Okay. <laughs> well, there, there isn't any. I have a degree in computer science. That's there's why no, I'm there's no uh, specific uh, language that they use. Oh. Um, gosh, it can be anything. 
A lot oh. depends on what it is they're trying to accomplish. They're trying to do. Oh, okay. yeah, most of it is Windows based. Oh, okay. A lot of things are, are bleeding over into Linux side or uh, like Android. I mean, yeah, Android and Raspberry Pis, their OSs. But uh, most is Windows uh, related. For the for the end consumer, they're writing a lot of stuff for Windows. Um, mm. Behind the scenes, a lot of it is. Uh, say maybe, and I don't know anything about computer languages, but say C plus or oh, okay. something like that. Right, written, right. Written in some type of code uh, that the, you use to write code, and there's very uh, flavors of that, so I think. Right, right. And a lot of it is being open source, so whatever is the main open source software that's out there, there's a lot of it being written in that. Okay. I think one of the nice things about commercial radio, and you kind of hit on really quick, but uh, this isn't an exclusive club. Everything that is hard to do with ham radio is available for all of us. There are really not a lot of secrets out there. If you want to do uh, the uh, digital side, it's easy. You know what happens to develop things. It's already been done, and it's just here. Right, right. So it, it is amazing how accessible all these different facets are in the kind of radio. Back in the early days, well, 35, 40 years ago, when I got into it, you could talk or you could do CW, and that's all there was. And now, I mean, it's just, it's mostly all digital in so many different ways now. Yeah, it just keeps evolving as, as you keep going. What is CW? <coughs> that is Morse code. Oh, CW okay. means continuous wave. Oh, dip right. down, dips and down. Oh, oh okay. Right. Jeff learned some. <laughs> I did. I did learn some. I've already forgotten some. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Just remember, dip, dip, down, dip, dip, down, dip, dip, down. You, you, you. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Okay, so we, we talk about ham radio, amateur, the amateur radio. There are a lot of different kinds of radios. Anybody ever heard of this one? CB? 10-4 oh, yeah. good buddy. 10-4 good buddy, yeah. How about this one? GMRS. General Mobile Radio Service. There's another one, FRS, Walmart, Walmart. That's family, right? family, Fa radio. family radio service. Do you need a license for this, for CB? No. no. Not anymore, you used to. Okay, not anymore. Do you need a license for this one? Yes. Yes, yes you do. No test. No test. $35. And what's that $35 for? It's basically for a family. I actually got my GMRS license so that I could take two, GMR two GMRS radios with me to Arizona when I was driving with my son to Denver. And we could communicate vehicle to vehicle across the Indian Reservation when we could not have any cell service. So, and he could operate under my license because he was, he's my son. Family radio service, license needed? Nope. Nope. MERS. 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 And that stands for? Martian Union Radio Service. I don't, I don't have any idea what it stands for either. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of different you know, types of radio, some need license, some do not, some need, some need tests, some need tests, ham radio, needs t a test, you need a license, why, why would you need one, if all these other radios don't need them, why would ham radio need a license and, it, and it need to pass a test, any idea? More power. More power. More coverage. 
So, so if you look at these, these are limited in, in how much power they can go, you can put out, right? CB radio, FR, FRS, I think is limited to what, a half a watt? Something like that. They're very small. Very short distance. One to three miles, maybe, right? GMRS, you get a little bit more power that you can use. Um, I got a GMRS radio that looks just about like this. And, you know, five miles you can, you can hit. Now, a ham, the top power that you can put out is 1,500 watts, right? Not a lot of people do that. There are some that have amplifiers that pop those out at 1,500. And they just, they just overpower everybody. But your, your normal in the shack radio, you're going to have maybe 100 watts, right? Which is adequate. I found it's adequate. I can reach anywhere with that 100 watts. Bruce could reach across the parking lot. Bruce could reach across the parking lot and he takes out everybody else's radio when he was running 100 watts. Rick was going to reach around the parking lot too. I know. But so having a license that gives us a lot of opportunities. You know, they're unlicensed radios that we've talked about. But, but why get a license? I think one of the most important reasons and benefits of being licensed is that you're, you're actually protected. Having a license protects you. It protects you from interference. Interference from, you know, there can be people who go out and get a ham license or a ham radio and start operating without a license. They can be found. And uh, if they're misusing the airways, there are ham operators that are going to go find them. I had a uh, friend of mine in Duluth, one of the new LC years, but he had a, uh, a modified ham radio on 11 meters on the CB bands, you know, with a kilowatt. And they caught him. And he told him he'd get his license or he would go to jail. So he got his license. And I think it's important to have your license too because a lot of the things you learn in ham radio, it revolves around the safety of it and then you don't understand, I guess, you know, about wires and then you get to throwing up wires and we're on and then you want to transmit somebody to somebody will grab it. Well, it's also watch through a wire. Could you imagine? And, uh, that could be done. Yeah, could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. S safety. Safety is a real big thing in the ham radio um, arena. And when we get to week number eight or nine, I think, we're going to be talking about safety. It's that important that there's a whole section that we're going to talk about safety. And uh, week nine. Well, yes. What does CB stand for? Citizens Band. Citizens Band. Oh, yep. Okay. You don't want to get on that nowadays. <laughs> you know, I, I haven't been on that for years. There's a lot of garbage out there. All these ones, Channel 19. Channel 19, yep. Eleven, 11 meter. meter, yep. And and we'll talk about the meters and and that, how it relates to frequencies as we get into. I think we'll talk start talking about it next week. But anyway, this yeah. Multi-use radio service. Multi-use radio service. There we go. Okay. So getting licensed, understanding the principles of electricity. The radio technology and operating rules, there are operating rules that we follow as a ham radio operator. And uh, it, uh, it gives us uniformity in, in how, we, how we operate that radio. So the first step is to get your technician's class license. And that's, that's what we're studying for. And it gives you certain band privileges. And you're able to get on the air and communicate with other ham operators. Then you can go to a general class license, which is grade up, which gives you opportunity to operate in more of the HF bands. With a technician's class, you can get on some HF, but it's very limited. But we do operate in that every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. It's on the HF bands that the technician's license will get you there. 
So uh, once you get your technician's license, you can get on that net and talk to Jay. And, uh, answer and answer trivia questions. All right. And then uh, after a general class license is the amateur extra class license, which gives you expanded privileges on the, on the airways. Okay. So there's a lot of education that can go into, you know, the amateur radio. Um, 